So we are back with chapter 17, the endocrine system. Um, this is going to be part three of our notes. As we peruse through these sections, we're going to take a look at some cell chemistry. What exactly are the hormones made out of? We're also going to take a look at um, what it means by amplification of the signal, as well as how to clear out hormones once the body no longer needs them. And we're going to finish it up by taking a look at one of the most interesting aspects, to me at least, um, clinical applications. All right, so hormone chemistry basically discusses um, from a chemical standpoint what exactly hormones are made out of. And obviously we can discuss this in great detail, but because we already have such a massive list of hormones to kind of know, um, we're going to kind of keep it to basics, okay? So for hormone chemistry, you just want to keep in mind that all hormones will fall into three categories. They can either be classified as a steroid, which means that they're derived from cholesterol, or they can be class they can go ahead and be classified as monoamines and peptides. Both the monoamines and the peptides will be composed of amino acids. It just de depends on how many and how they're structured that will separate them into the monoamine and or the peptide category. Now, please notice that on your PowerPoint, um, it does give you different examples of hormones that fall into each. And what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of try to keep track of everything. So on your end, you're going to know that the hormones that are steroids, one, are derived from cholesterol, and two examples of those would be your sex steroids. So we're thinking about our estrogen and we're thinking about our testosterone. Okay, the second one, the monoamines, you're going to know that those are made out of amino acids. And our examples are going to be our catecholamines, so our epinephrine, and our dopamine, and our thyroid hormone. And the third one, the peptides, we're going to know that they are made out of amino acids. And those will include the hormones that come from your pituitary glands. Now, another thing that you want to kind of keep in mind is that um, all cells have a cell membrane, and the cell membrane is, is semi-selective. Uh, it is composed of a phospholipid bilayer, which means that it has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic quality over to it. This is important to point out because it turns out that when we look at our monoamines and our peptide hormones, those are going to be hydrophilic, water-loving. And when they're water-loving, that means that these hormones can easily be released into the blood. Um, it will easily interact with the blood plasma, which is mostly water. And we see when it gets to its target cells, the receptors of those cells will most likely be located on top of the plasma membrane. So the particular hormone that is monoamine or peptide based will not have to pass through the membrane. It will not have to actually enter inside the cell. Instead, the receptors will be located right on the membrane and go ahead and they can get activated as soon as possible. On the other hand, if we look at our cholesterol-based hormones, what we see is that they are water-fearing or hydrophobic. Now, it also turns out that our thyroid hormone, which we just saw on the previous slide as being classed as a monoamine, is a little bit of an exception to the rule. Your thyroid hormone will start off as being hydrophilic, but when it has its mature slash final shape, it turns out that it actually starts leaning more towards the hydrophobic side. So that is why on this particular slide, you see that not only are the steroids, which are cholesterol-based, labeled as hydrophobic, so is your thyroid hormone. And because they're hydrophobic water-fearing, they cannot simply be transported into the bloodstream because it would have too much of a strain on their half-life. So instead, what we see happening is that oftentimes they will go ahead and find a transport protein to bind to and to almost piggyback on as they travel through the bloodstream. And binding to a transport protein would makes them bound. So bound hormones are the ones that are piggyback of these transport proteins. And it turns out by linking together, it actually increases their half-life because the hydrophobic hormones are shielded from the water properties as well as protected from being filtered out by different enzymes and the kidney.
The hormone will stay bound to the transport protein until it gets very close to a target cell, and at that point it is released, and when it re is released, the, it actually has to enter inside the target cell. So as you can see, it says right there at the bottom of the PowerPoint, it says the target cell receptors tend to be intracellular. So these hydrophobic hormones who do not want to interact with water will not stay outside of the cell membrane. They will actually easily flow through the cell membrane because of its hydrophobic quantities, and it will easily pass through the membrane, and it will interact with receptors that are inside the cell. So just a quick overview, if you see that you have a hormone that is hydrophilic, it will easily flow in the bloodstream and it will interact with receptors that are on the plasma membrane. If you see that you have hormones that are hydrophobic, it will need to bind to a transport protein in order to travel to the bloodstream. And when it gets to its target cell, it will actually have to enter into the cell to interact with these intracellular receptors. I should point out that there are plenty of examples where there are hydrophobic hormones that travel by themselves. However, what we do see is that they either tend to travel a short distance or they have a very short half-life. All right, so this is just a quick FYI on that thyroid hormone. Um, remember I mentioned to you that even though it's composed of amino acids, in its final form, it will be hydrophobic. And we see that when it comes to utilizing its transport mechanism, it can utilize various ones. The most common one that it likes to use is albumin. Um, and what we'll do is we're going to kind of leave that albumin in more detail off until we get to some chapters down the road where we'll discuss that more. But that is one of the primary proteins that we have floating in our blood plasma. We also see that the steroid hormones will tend to bind to globulins. Um, and aldosterone right there, that's another example of a hydrophobic hormone. Um, however, this one, as you can see, the majority of it is unbound, which means that it has a very short half-life, meaning it doesn't stay in the bloodstream too long before it's actually destroyed up to 50% of the original quantity. All right, so... Um, I think it surprises a lot of people to learn that when they go and they get a blood panel done to see that most hormones are actually only present in very minute quantities in our bloodstream, yet they have such a profound effect on our body. So the question I always get asked is why are hormone concentrations usually low? Why aren't they at higher levels if they have such an important role? And it turns out that hormones don't need to be produced in high quantities, and that is because they're able to amplify their signal and activate a cascading pathway. So what you can think about is, and you can also view the image for you on the right-hand side, is that a small amount of hormone, when it interacts with its target cell, will go ahead and often activate a wide array of secondary messengers and enzymes. And as it's activating these secondary messengers, such as CM and different protein kinases, it goes ahead and on each end activates hundreds, if not thousands more, of different enzymes. And the more enzymes we activate, the greater the metabolic product is that we get. So it's basically a domino effect. A little bit affects more and more and more. And the more you go down the chain, the more cascading or amplifying that result is. And that is then why you can get away with having low hormone concentrations. And that's because their result, once again, is explained in an amplifying or cascading mechanism. We also see that we can regulate how sensitive our body is to hormones by taking a look at the number of receptors that you have on your target cells. So this slide talks about what we call upregulation and downregulation. Now please keep in mind that I'm not talking about increasing or decreasing the number of target cells. I'm talking about increasing and decreasing the number of receptors that you have on the cells. 
So for instance, you're still going to maintain the same number. Let's say you have a thousand cells. You'll always have a thousand cells, but how many receptors are found on those thousand cells, we can change. So if you upregulate, that means you increase the receptors, and the more receptors you have, the more you, of an amplified response you can get from your hormone. If you downregulate, that means that you reduce the number of receptors, so the cell becomes less sensitive, and you have more of a muted response. So let me give you an example that I posted on your PowerPoints for you right here. So it says if you're upregulating, that means you increase the number of receptors, which means that your response will also be amplified and you have more sensitivity to the hormone. We see this, for instance, when a woman is pregnant. During pregnancy, the body will have higher levels of estrogen than normal. And part of that is because the estrogen will be able to assist the development of the fetus, but also what we see happening is that the, the estrogen will travel over and stimulate the receptors on the uterus to be more sensitive to oxytocin, and it will cause those receptors to become upregulated. So all the cells that are able to respond to oxytocin in the uterus will go ahead and increase the amount of receptors that they normally house. As a result, when it's time for the labor to occur, what we see happening is the oxytocin has a much easier time finding receptors. Because there are so many receptors, there's an amplified response, which means that the contractions can go ahead and build up faster, and the birthing process can proceed at a faster rate. This is one of the reasons why with every pregnancy, it seems as if the labor is reduced for many women. Part of that is because the cells will increase their receptors at a faster rate, allowing the body to have a more amplified response. So once again, I'm not changing the amount of cells. I'm changing how many receptors are on top of those cells. Downregulation is going to be the opposite. When you're downregulating, you're going to reduce the number of receptors. Usually we see that if the body is exposed to extreme high levels of a hormone, or we could also see it, for instance, in excessive drug use. For instance, there have been lots of studies done on people that are addicted to opioids. And what we see happening is that opioids give us a sensation of euphoria, that we're happy, because part of it is that they interact with the receptors that are meant to be for our endorphins. Our endorphins are our body's natural way to make us feel happy. So what we see happening is that your body will have the receptors that are dedicated to the euphoria feeling. If you now go on uh, different kinds of drugs, what we see is that those drugs can interact with the receptors, artificially creating a feeling of happiness and content. With excessive drug use or excessive exposure to these drugs, the signal will start to become diminished and it will start down-regulating itself. Part of that is because our body needs to be able to maintain um, sensitivity for all around, so we can't be in this content, happy state because that lowers our ability to detect dangers that are in our environment. So what the body will do is it will down-regulate the receptors for the endorphins so that it's more aware of everything else that's happening. However, as it down-regulates, what we see happening with drug users is that they often have to increase the amount of drugs that they have to take because it becomes harder and harder for the drugs to locate those down-regulated receptors. Now, what if you then say, you know what, I am no longer going to do drugs, I want to get clean. Well, a lot of times what we see happening is that if they stop taking those opioids right away, they go through some extreme withdrawal symptoms. And part of that is because the body does not have enough receptors to naturally regulate its endorphin cycle. So that is why there are a boatload of different medications that are being offered when patients try to detox, in essence, to give the body time to go back to the num normal number of endorphin receptors so that the patients do not feel horrible and have um, drug withdrawal symptoms along the way. 
All right, so that was a very long explanation on the previous slide. My apologies, but on this illustration right here, it basically just gets right to the point. It shows you on top that if you do upregulation, what you're doing is you're changing the number of receptors. So as you can see, those are the purple indentations towards the top of the cell, and you get a stronger response. And if you're doing a down regulation, then you're going to diminish or get rid or reduce the number of receptors, thereby getting a diminished response. So do you alter the quantity of target cells? No. You keep the same number, but you alter the number of receptors. Another thing that we should talk about is the fact that most target cells will have receptors for multiple hormones. So we often see that there is a relationship that occurs when you start mixing and matching hormones. And this interactive um, relationship can either be described as synergistic, permissive, or antagonistic. A synergistic effect means that the sum is greater than the individual parts. So by multiple hormones combining together, they get such a drastic or amplified response that you wouldn't be able to get from just one or two of those hormones by themselves. A really good example is the one that's listed on your PowerPoint. We see, for instance, in the gonads that if we want to increase our sperm production to maximum, we need the follicle-stimulating hormone and the testosterone to work together. And by mixing these two hormones, you get a more amplified result. We also see, for instance, with synergistic effects, if we take a look at our sympathetic nervous system, oftentimes we'll see that epinephrine will go ahead and interact with norepinephrine um, to go ahead and give you that really heightened effect. A permissive effect is when one hormone enhances the response of a secondary hormone. And um, a little bit ago, I was telling you about the fact that when a woman is pregnant, she releases high levels of estrogen, and those estrogens will travel over to the uterus and will get the uterus to upregulate their oxytocin receptors. That would be an example of a permissive effect, where the estrogen was basically prepping the uterus to become more sensitive and more enhanced to the response of the oxytocin. In pregnancy, there are many hormones that are permissive to get the body ready. So as you can see right here, there's another one with estrogen preparing the uterus now to receive progesterone. So anytime you come across a scenario where you see that you have one hormone that's released and it increases the sensitivity of the target cells for a secondary hormone, please go ahead and mark that as a permissive effect. And then last one is the antagonistic effect. This is when one opposes the other. And we've actually, we're talking about that before. Remember how we talked about the fact that you have your calcitonin and your parathyroid hormone, and they basically work opposites when it comes to calcium levels in the blood. We also talked about glucose. Um, when we did the insulin and the glucogen, we see that they go ahead and they work opposite from each other when it comes to regulate your blood glucose levels. How about inhibin? You guys remember inhibin from the gonads? Um, inhibin works the opposite and basically antagonizes your follicle-stimulating hormone and your luteinizing hormone. So an antagonistic effect is when one hormone opposes the action of another. All right, so an overview. Synergistic is when they work together to get a more amplified result. Permissive is when one enhances the reaction of the second. And antagonistic is when one opposes the action or cancels the action of the other. Here's just a quick little illustration of an antagonistic reaction between the insulin and the glucogen. And it's just basically showing you how on the left-hand side you have your bloodstream. And it shows you that within the liver cell itself, um, actions of the insulin will cause blood sugars to be absorbed into the liver because we know insulin will create the pathway for your glucose to enter into the target cells, whereas glucogen will cause an elevated response of your blood sugar because the liver will go ahead and activate its glyconolysis and gluconogenesis, thereby releasing glucose into the bloodstream. So they work antagonistic or they work opposite from each other.
All right, so what do you do? You have um, stimulated the hormone, you have released the hormone, it went over to the target cell, you have the response, so now it's time for hormone clearance, meaning time to clean up. We no longer need the hormone, the signal has been turned off, how do we get rid of it? Um, there are many mechanisms that we see that the body will utilize. Um, sometimes the body will go ahead and just simply cleave off the hormone, making it inactive. There's been examples where the target cells will actually remove the receptors, so there's nothing to interact with the hormones anymore. But the most common way to get rid of any excess hormones is to rely on the liver and the kidneys. The liver and the kidneys will actually take up and break down any excess hormone that remains in the bloodstream. So it's not the only way to get rid of it, but it is the most common way. Use your liver and your kidneys to take up the hormone and get rid of it. We also see that oftentimes when you discuss hormone clearance, you're going to come across the term metabolic clearance rate and half-life. The metabolic clearance rate is basically how fast you remove a hormone from the blood. Your half-life is how long does it take to get down to 50% of the original amount of the hormone. Okay, so the rate, your MCR, takes a look at how fast you can clear out that hormone, and your half-life takes a look at how long before I get down to 50% of my original amount. So at the bottom it says, the faster the metabolic clearance rate is going to be, the shorter the half-life, because the faster means you can clear it up really quickly, you can get rid of it, do the clearance on it, and since you're cleaning it up so quickly, that means it's going to take a short amount of time for you to get to down to 50%. Um, the slower the metabolic rate, the longer the half-life, because the hormone will be able to stay in the bloodstream for a longer period of time. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some clinical applications um, that we come into contact with the endocrine system. And probably one that's very applicable right now is how your body responds to stress and adaptation. And stress from a scientific view is basically anything that upsets your homeostasis. Um, it could be something that is physical, something that's psychological, something that's emotional. Um, it can be because um, you are about to go in for surgery, you just got into um, um, you know, a nasty accident, maybe you have a relative who's not feeling well, um, and if we want to make it applicable to the situation we're in now, you know, we know that the coronavirus is out there, so many of us are very anxious because, you know, we obviously don't want to get sick, but we also want to make sure that we're being safe around the elderly and people that are immunocompromised, and at the same time, we kind of want to make sure that we have everything we need in our house in case we have to self-quarantine. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and even even without the coronavirus on our most day-to-day -day activities, we have things like trying to fit in all our schoolwork, you know, how are we going to keep up with work? A lot of us have kids that we have to chase after. In my case, I have a dog that sleeps most of the day, so I guess I'm not chasing after him too much. But either way, I worry about my little Chucky, got to make sure he has a lot of food. And what we see happening is all this can place stress on the body. And when you place stress on the body, you start to upset your homeostasis. So we usually see that it's going to cause you to elevate some of the hormone levels. And a lot of these hormones are going to come courtesy of the adrenal gland, you know, the one that sits on top of your kidneys. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how does your body adapt to stress. And usually we call that the general adaptation syndrome or GAS, G-A-S. And the general adaptation syndrome takes a look at when our body is reacting to stress, it will release lots of epinephrine and cortisol. And as it's releasing those hormones, we're going to see it's going to transition us into three stages. Alarm reaction, stage of resistance, and stage of exhaustion. 
The first stage of our GAS reaction is going to be called the alarm reaction. This is our initial response. This is usually when you're exposed on a short-term level of stress. So many of us have experienced this stage before where you get really mad at something, you get really hyped up about something, and you feel your body increasing, it's blood pressure, it's heart rate, you notice that your breathing rate starts to get altered. Um, this is classic signs of the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And it's due to the fact that your body becomes flooded with epinephrine from the adrenal medulla. So remind yourself that the adrenal gland is the one that sits on top of the kidney. And the medulla is the one that's going to give us lots of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And the reaction will be that we're going to have to look for alternative, I'm sorry, we're going to have to look for lots and lots of fuel sources. So your body's going to go ahead and try to find as much glucose and glycogen as it can find, and it will flood the body with that blood sugar. And at the same time, we're going to notice that our body goes and starts increasing our blood pressure, our heart rate, and our breathing rate. We also see that there will be aldosterone that will be released, and that will actually promote water conservation. So your body will try to prevent dehydration, as well as if there's anything that can hurt you and can cause bleeding. It will try to limit the amount of loss of fluid when you're in the alarm reaction. Now, the alarm reaction, our first step, will stay as long as you have glycogen. If your glycogen reserve runs out and you're still in that hyped up stage, that stressful stage, then what we see happening is that your body will transition to stage number two, which is going to be called the stage of resistance. This one is going to be classified by lots and lots of cortisol. And the cortisol is going to come courtesy of the adrenal cortex. So the first stage was for the adrenal medulla with the epinephrine, and now we're in our second stage, and we're doing our stage of resistance. This one's going to be fueled by the adrenal cortex and the release of cortisol. And cortisol is going to work very similar in the fact that it's going to continue looking for fuel sources, but now since glycogen has been removed, we're going to look for fuel sources that are more based on fatty acids as well as amino acids, so more of the gluconogenesis that will occur. As your body becomes fueled with cortisol, what we see happening is that we might run into some adverse effects. And this is only seen when you have extreme high levels of cortisol for a prolonged period of time. And that is that it will go ahead and cause a heightened amount of anti-inflammatory reactions, which in turn can actually suppress your immune system. And as this is happening, it makes it more likely for you to become susceptible to opportunistic bacteria or viruses, making it pro more prone for you to get sick. So when people say that stress can actually make you sick, they know what they're talking about because lots and lots of research has been shown that high levels of cortisol will actually increase your chances of getting a bacterial infection, a viral infection, or even things like ulcers. So try to stay as calm as possible. I know you're rolling your eyes at me. It's easier said than done. But hey, that's how the body reacts. Um, as a side note, we also see that in the stage of resistance, your reproductive system is not functioning optional, which often means that if you're trying to get pregnant, it'll be, have a very difficult time because the cortisol is inhibiting the normal regulation of your reproductive organs and follicles. Now, if you are in a stressful situation for a very long time, what we usually see happening is that you can enter the third stage. This one is what I like to call the danger zone. It is the stage of exhaustion. This usually will take a few months to get to it, but you have to imagine that your body is basically looking for as much glucose and energy as it can find. So it's basically going through all your glycogen, all your amino acids, all your fatty acids, and it will even go after your fat reserve. And as we see that the fat reserve starts 
to dwindle, then we start to also see that homeostasis starts to diminish and the system becomes overwhelmed. Patients that go into the stage of exhaustion without medical um, intervention or medical help, their health will rapidly decline and can even be deadly. At this stage, your protein and your muscles basically start wasting away and breaking down. And that's because your body is desperately trying to find glucose to keep you running in um, this stressful situation. We see that you will start to lose your balance of your potassium um, as well as your hydrogen ions, which can lead you to hypokalemia and alkalosis, and the upsetting of the pH can be detrimental to the system. Usually we see that the patients will get overwhelming infections, which starts to take over the immune system, and very shortly after, we often see kidney infections as well as congestive heart failure that plays a role. This is a very dangerous zone and once again uh, without medical assistance it could be very deadly. Alrighty, so let's take a look at some other disorders besides stress, <laughs> which is a big one. Um, we often see that if there is a clinical application for the endocrine system, it can be due either to not producing enough hormone or producing too much hormone. So over here, we have an example of a hyposecretion. Hyposecretion is when your body is not secreting enough hormone. Um, this can be due to many reasons, but the example that's on our PowerPoint is the fact that you might have a tumor or any type of lesion that has destroyed the gland, and now you're not able to release the hormones as um, is caused. For instance, we see that there can be trauma done to the posterior pituitary glands, ability to store ADH, and in that case, it can actually cause diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with glucose levels. Um, it gets the term diabetes because it alters your water balance within the body and it causes you to have chronic polyuria, meaning that you are consistently peeing high levels of water. It makes your body very prone to becoming dehydrated, which kind of makes sense because your antidiuretic hormone plays such a huge role in our water balance. So if there's anything wrong and you're not producing enough ADH, your body loses that control of water balance. Another thing that we see is that there's been incidents where you can have autoantibodies, antibodies that will go ahead and start attacking your own healthy cells. And this has been studied excessively in people with diabetes. And what we see happening is many people who have diabetes 1 actually develop it due to an autoimmune disease. And in that case, they'll produce antibodies against a virus. And at one point or another, the antibodies will actually turn on the beta cell in the pancreas and start destroying them, destroying them to the level that the body is no longer able to keep up with the insulin secretion, leading the patients to develop diabetes. There are also examples of hypersecretion. Hypersecretion is obviously when you're producing an excess amount of hormones. We can also see examples of that when there are tumors or autoimmune disorders. So it can go either way. It all depends on how you're affecting your hormone levels. So the first one I want to talk to you about is actually the most common one, which is your toxic goiter or grave disease. This is usually seen when you have autoantibodies that will actually go ahead and they'll mimic your thyroid stimulating hormone, causing your thyroid to become overactive and to start hypersecreting thyroid hormone. And as it's becoming overreactive, your thyroid will actually increase in size. And as it enlarges, it actually forms that goiter, that large hump by the throat region. And that is very sympathetic of Graves' disease. Another hypersecretion that I wanted to talk to you about is called agromyalgi. Agromyalgi is when you have excessive amount of growth hormone that's produced during adulthood. Usually this is seen when there's a tumor on the anterior pituitary gland and that tumor causes excessive growth hormone to be secreted. Now, 
Think back to 2085 when you talked about bone growth and you guys might remember your epiphalceal plate, your growth plate. And part of what 2085 discussed is that as your growth hormone naturally tapers down when you get into adulthood, the growth plate will close off and it will go ahead and become the epiphalceal line. When the growth plate is closed and it becomes the line, the bone can no longer grow lengthwise. Now, what does this have to do with agromalgy? Well, if you develop a tumor on your pituitary gland and all of a sudden in your adulthood you start secreting high levels of growth hormone, we see that the growth hormone can affect the bone's growth, but since the bone can't grow lengthwise, it will start to grow widthwise. So we start to see that the bones become wider. And oftentimes with patients, we see that their face, their feet, and their hands will start to increase in size. They become wider. So if you want, you can go ahead and take a look at the illustrations that I've placed for you. The first one is of a patient that starts off with the picture in 1977. And you can see as it progresses down 11 years, how the face starts to widen. And that's because the bones are responding to that access level of growth hormone. You can also take a look at the illustrations that are on the side, and you can see how the face starts to morph. A lot of times this will take years to develop, so it takes the patient quite a while to figure out that something isn't normal and that they probably should go over. And then the doctor might even take a little bit more time to figure out that it's the growth hormone and that they need to go ahead and find an endocrinologist to assist. Now, I put in a question and I said, is this the same as gigantism? And the answer is no. Gigantism is when you have a... Um, increase in growth hormone or prolonged secretion of growth hormone before the epiphalceal plate closes off. And if you have excessive amount of growth hormone or if the growth hormone doesn't naturally taper down, the epiphalceal plate will never close, which means that the bone will keep elongating. And that is then how we end up with the world's tallest man or the world's tallest woman. Um, this can be very dangerous because as the bones keep getting longer and longer, it actually becomes more harder for your body to maintain their consistency. And a lot of times they can become brittle and very hard to heal if they are fractured. So either scenario is not optimal. I also want to talk to you guys about diabetes because diabetes is probably one of the most common endocrine diseases that we have to tackle in the world right now. Um, diabetes basically means that you have an interruption in your production of insulin and that that insulin cannot properly regulate your glucose absorption. Diabetes is usually indicated or uh, symptomized by the three P's, polyuria polydipsia and polyphagia. Polyuria means excessive urine output, polydipsia, intense thirst, and polyphagia, hunger. Now, think about this process from um, this scenario, okay? So hopefully by now you're comfortable with the fact that when you eat carbohydrates, your body breaks it down into glucose. And that glucose has to enter into the majority of your cells for cellular respiration and energy demands. However, the glucose needs insulin to make that connection. So without insulin, the glucose doesn't go into the cell. The cell can't keep up with its energy demand. So imagine now that you're looking at a patient who has undiagnosed or uncontrolled diabetes. That patient will sit there and eat carbohydrates, but the glucose will never make it into the individual cell. So the patient always complains of being hungry because the cells are not getting the energy that they require. Meanwhile, all that glucose is circulating into the bloodstream. It can't go anywhere. So what ends up happening is that your kidney starts filtering it out because it's upsetting your water balance. So you start to pee more. That's your polyuria. And as you're urinating more, you're also becoming dehydrated because you're taking all this water out of your system. So what we see is that you have polydipsia, intense thirst. Now, as you're urinating all that access glucose out, your urine will have a very sweet smell to it. In fact, that was one of the earliest ways of diagnosing diabetes is that the patient would complain that the urine was very sweet and there has been 
um, information that back in the day, nurses would actually dip and smell and taste the urine. So, nope, thank you on that one. We have other methods to diagnose diabetes now. All right, so now, when it comes to diabetes, we tend to classify them into two types. We have type 1 diabetes, which used to be called juvenile diabetes. It's not called that anymore because you can basically develop it during any part of your life, and you have type 2 diabetes. Now, what is the difference? Type 1 diabetes basically means that your body is not producing enough or any insulin. In type 1 diabetes, you will always need to go ahead and supplement your insulin intake, whether you're doing your injections or you're doing the pump. You will have to continuously monitor your blood glucose level to figure out how much additional insulin you need to inject. And this is something that will remain for the rest of your life because your pancreas, your beta cells are not producing insulin or they're not producing enough insulin. And this can be due to a genetic disorder, but we also know that there are some autoimmune diseases out there that can accidentally destroy your beta cells, causing type 1 diabetes to be uh, developed. The only way to get rid of type 1 diabetes would be if you get a pancreas uh, replacement or if you get stem cell therapy, either of which are very hard to come by. So for many of us, if we have type 1, we will have that for the rest of the life, completely manageable as long as we keep an eye on our insulin and glucose levels. Type 2 diabetes is by far the most common diabetes. This one is known as adult onset diabetes, or I should say it was known as adult onset diabetes. Now we've removed that because we have a lot of children that are being diagnosed with type 2. In type 2, your body is producing insulin, but for some reason or another, the insulin is not able to connect with the target cell. And a lot of times we see that if you have excessive adipose tissue, the hormones and chemicals released by the adipose tissue will actually inhibit the insulin from connecting to the target cells. So if you look over on the PowerPoint, you're going to notice that under the risk factors, you're going to see things like we know there's a hereditary link. We know that as you get older, you're more prone to develop it, but the, by far the biggest characteristic or risk factor is obesity. We see that obesity has a huge effect on increasing your glucose level and making it more resistant to the insulin reaction. So the good news is, is that type 1 is also completely manageable. The even better news is, is that if you maintain your weight and increase your weight loss and your exercise, you have a very high chance that you lose that excess weight and you lose that insulin resistance meaning you don't have to be type 2 diabetic for the rest of your life. Some people don't even have to go on medication. They just have to be very careful about how many carbs they are exposed to on their day-to-day -day, um, digestion. So on your PowerPoint, I wrote down, it can easily be treated with weight loss program and exercise. And we know that the disease can retreat if you have proper lifestyle changes. However, if it does progress, then there will be necessity for medication, and this can obviously vary anywhere from oral medication that's taken every once in a while to daily medications that might even include the insulin pump. All right, everybody. Good news is we made it to the end of Chapter 17. So please, please, please keep using those discussion sections. Post all your questions, comments, and concern. And like I said to you many times before, I'm always available through email. All right. Our next lecture will take a look at Chapter 18. So we'll talk soon again.